So welcome to my CCMP version 7 switching lecture. We're focusing on chapter 5 of the foundation textbook. And this is about inner VLAN routing and DHCP. So the actual material in the foundation book is kind of short. So what I did was I went ahead and I included my inner VLAN routing and my DHCP lectures for my CCNA material. Because in reality, it's the same information, just presented again. So, let's talk about inner VLAN routing. What is inner VLAN routing? Essentially, if we are on one network, a 172.16.10.100 computer, we're right here, and we try to ping this PC over here, will it work? No, it won't. Uh, the, what will happen is it will try to communicate with it, but it's not on the same network, so it has to go to a layer 3 device to translate to the other IP address. So you'll notice the third octet are different. So that means it has to go to a layer 3 device. And these are actually on different VLANs. So again, same thing. They will not communicate. It may send up an ARP request, but because the third octet is not in the same network, it won't. Uh, also, there is no default gateway. There is no layer 3 uh, address, so it won't. So how does all of this quite work? Oh, went to me over. So it's actually going to look at the source and destination address portion in the headers. And it's going to see if they're the same network. If they are the same network, they'll process. If it won't, it will try to send it to a default gateway. If the destination MAC address if of the same device as the destination IP address, it will check the ARP cache for an entry of the destination IP address. If no entry is there, the ARP request destination IP address last for MAC address. Then the destination MAC address will be that of the default gateway, assuming that the default gateway is set. It will check the ARP cache for the entry for the default gateway IP address, and if no entry, then the ARP request of the default gateway address, it'll ask. So essentially, what, what that really means is, it will see if the source and destination are the same network. If they're not, it will actually, the destination will be changed to the default gateway MAC address. It will then try to find the IP address of the default gateway via its MAC address. If it doesn't have it, it will send an ARP request. That way it knows where to send it to the default gateway. Because remember, for any destination IP address, if it's a different network, it will be sent to the default gateway of our LAN segments. So in our VLAN routing, we can have no external routers. So that means all of them will go to, there'll be a hard link between each uh, VLAN and the router. Here we have literally three dedicated links between our switch and our router. We transition that to a trunk link, and on that trunk link, all three uh, VLANs. We could also have it a multi-layer switch and all the appropriate VLANs. And how we would program that is just like they are separate interfaces. But there's this concept called router on a stick. And here we would have one trunk, and we would do what's called sub-interfaces. Again, this is all the repeat for the CCNA material. But you do a sub-interface so that each VLAN would have an exit point on the router, and you do your encapsulation dots, and you would assign whatever the appropriate interface is. So if we're doing VLAN 2, it'd be encapsulate dot 1Q 2 because that's going to tell it the appropriate 
VLAN exit. Here for VLAN 10, this will be the exit for VLAN 10. Here will be VLAN 20, will be the exit for VLAN 20. Alright, so let's hop over to our DHCP. DHCP will use an IP subnet broadcast to the 255, 255, 255, 255 address. Keep in mind that routers do not route these packets by default. So some form of broadcast forwarding mechanism must be in place. The broadcast forwarding feature supports more than just the DHCP and can also forward other UDP broadcasts. So we're going to talk about specifically the relay agent, but there's also other UDP broadcast forwarding mechanisms. So a router and layer 3 switch can be configured to forward these addresses to a unicast address. So if we want to contact this DHCP server from this cloud, we can have it forward through our layer 3 device. But remember, by default, this doesn't happen because the layer 3 device will not forward broadcasts. So this concept is called a relay agent. So the layer 3 device will not forward these broadcasts. The issue is if we have DHCP clients in one network and we want to have it forward to an appropriate DHCP server, we're going to have to have the forwarder. Normally for each subnet, we're going to have its own DHCP server. So keep that in mind. So what we have to do is we have to program this IP helper address so that they will forward to the appropriate DHCP server. That way it will take that broadcast and will forward it to that address, to that unicast address. So the no IP direct broadcast, that's going to be an important one. So the no IP direct broadcast prevents someone from doing a broadcast which could flood the NIC router or subnet if uh, it was enabled. Also, it will prevent the router from broadcasting its IP address. So this brings up more of a, cons uh, a security concern. Okay, but again, our focus here is the IP helper address. So the default DHCP relay agent is going to have some default forwarding services. For example, boot uh, or the boot p slash the DHCP for the client it's port 68 for the server it's 67. You want to know the UDP ports just because these are common ports. So for DNS 53 for name server it's 42, NetBIOS 137 for the datagram service 138, for TFTP 69, time 37. It's always important to make sure you know the correct UDP ports. Alright, so now this is where we talk about our IP direct broadcast. The no IP direct broadcast command configures the router to or switch to prevent the translation of a direct broadcast to a physical broadcast. So example, a specific broadcast might be the 10.2.1.0 network, the specific broadcast would be 10.2.1.255. That way it's not using the specific 255, 255, 255, 255 broadcast, it is being a more specific broadcast. So how do we set up UDP broadcast forwarding? is what we can do is IP helper address and then the address that we want to send it. If we want to set up just the forwarding protocol, IP forward protocol, UDP, and the appropriate UDP ports. If we want to get rid of it, use the no option.
And that's actually it for this chapter. But again, stay tuned. I'm going to include InterVLAN routing and DHCP for my other courses to make sure that we have a nice in-depth looking uh, at all of this material. Thank you. Welcome to Routing Essentials. This is going to be dealing with Chapter 5, Inner VLAN Routing. Alright, so what is Inner VLAN Routing? Uh, Inner VLAN Routing is going to be the routing between VLANs. And a big part of that is going to be dealing with how to configure it, how to troubleshoot it, as well as what are some Layer 3 uh, switching technologies. Our objectives are to describe the options for VLAN routing, to configure uh, legacy, to configure router on a stick, troubleshoot, and configuring uh, VLAN routing on a Layer 3 device. Lastly, troubleshooting uh, inner VLAN communication on a Layer 3 device. Alright, so, inner VLAN routing. That is going to be communicating between VLANs. So, it has to go up to some type of Layer 3 device. Here, uh, we have a router, a switch, and two PCs. The PCs are in different VLANs. So, this PC is in VLAN 10. It's going to travel up the switch and through a dedicated port, or a dedicated uh, access line to the router. That's all going to be VLAN 10. Router will then process it, retag it, and then send it down the VLAN 30 link through the VLAN uh, 30 link all the way down to PC3. That is a legacy technology. Layer 2 switches cannot forward between different VLANs without a Layer 3 device. In the past, actually, routers were used to route between VLANs. Each VLAN was connected to a different physical interface on a Layer 3 device. Normally a router, but that's not the only Layer 3 device out there. Because the router interfaces were connected to VLANs and had IP addresses from VLANs, routing between the VLANs was achieved. The larger the network grew, the more requirements, the more complex. Router on a stick uses a different pathway. What it does is it allows for us to use a trunk and then to configure a 802.1Q trunk port so that we could set a bridge, a pathway between our router and our switch so that we would have one link for all of VLANs to travel through. And what would happen is each VLAN would be stamped appropriately with that 802.1Q uh, tag. VLAN members or hosts were configured a specific exit on the router known as a sub-interface. And that sub-interface would act as its default gateway. It would be a virtual interface on the router. Only one of the router's physical interfaces were used. What about if we have multi-layer switches? And how does that affect inner VLAN routing? Multiple switches can perform layer 2 and layer 3 functions. So, again, we're going to get rid of a layer 3 device, no longer tying it to a router, but a, another layer 3 device, a layer 3 switch in this regard. Multi-layer switches support dynamic routing and inner VLAN routing internally on the switch because it's a layer 3 device. The multi-layer switches have to have an IP address. They have to have a virtual switched interface, also known as a switched virtual interface. The switch would understand a network layer uh, PDU. So that would be a layer, th uh, layer 3 packet. Therefore, out between the switched virtual interfaces, just as a, a router would do. With a multi layer switch, traffic is routed internally, internal on the switch. This routing process is suitable and a scalable solution. 
no longer being tied directly to a Layer 3 router. Or to a, a router, because a router is a Layer 3. But you could have other Layer 3 devices handling it. So, preparation. Legacy inter VLAN routing requires routers. That means you have to have a physical interface per route or per link for a connection. Each one of those routers' physical interfaces is connected to a unique VLAN. That's just retarded. Each interface is also configured with an IP address. Example, these links are all VLAN 10. These links are all VLAN 30. That's not a great idea, but that was an old way. How we did that is, we would create the VLANs first. VLAN 10 created VLAN 10. VLAN 30 created VLAN 30. Then we would navigate to each interface, and we would hard code it, switch port access, VLAN 10. That was one way of doing this. On the router, we would assign an IP address to each of those physical interfaces. That way, this IP address would be for VLAN 10. This IP address would be for VLAN 30. This was a really bad way of doing it, but this was one way. So the preparation for router on a stick. This allowed for us to use a trunk not having a unique interface. This would force us to have sub-interfaces. Here is VLAN 10, here is VLAN 30, and there would be a trunk between S1 and the router. On the router, we would have a sub-interface. Since it's physically plugged into G00, we would use a sub-interface G0 slash 0 dot 10. That would allow us to use the sub-interface dot 10. On the switch, all you'd have to do is configure the switch port for that connection to be a trunk. That's it. On the router side, you'd have to set the sub-interfaces correctly, uh, assign an IP address, and encapsulate it. An example would be interface G0 slash 0 dot 10. That created the dot 10 sub-interface. We would encapsulate it using encapsulate.1q. Next would be what VLAN is allowed on that sub-interface. That would be the 10 VLAN. Afterwards, assign it an IP address and a no shutdown. That's it. You go on to the next one. Interface G0 slash 0 dot 30. Do the encapsulate.1q. What VLAN is it? Dot 30, or it's VLAN 30. Assign an IP address, no shutdown. At the very end, make sure to turn on the parent interface. You notice they're all part of G0 slash 0. Make sure G slash 0 is turned on. So do a no shutdown there. That's it. Sub interfaces configured, inner VLAN uh, connections, good to go. Inner VLAN routing is pretty simple with router on a stick. You have to remember, create the sub-interfaces, encapsulate, use the appropriate .1Q, whatever VLAN they're in, turn on the parent interface. That's it. So how do we verify? You could do a show VLAN. You could see which VLANs are associated with it. You could see which lines are tied to trunks. Show VLANs on the router will actually show you the trunks. Show IP route on the router will show the sub-interfaces, both directly connected and a link local address. So, how can we verify? You can ping. Try pinging between the two PCs now, PC1 to PC3. They're on different VLAN, but as long as those virtual interfaces are correctly configured on the router, again, also known as sub-interfaces, you are good to go. So let's start talking about how to troubleshoot VLAN, uh, inter-VLAN routing.
the first thing you have to realize is, did you appropriately assign the individual ports to the appropriate VLAN? Don't forget, switch port mode access. Switch port access VLAN, what VLAN? Those have to be done under the appropriate interface because you're going to configure each interface. After you're done with that, have you set up the switch ports? Have you set up the trunk port on the switch? So navigate to whatever port is going to be the trunk. Make sure you're underneath the appropriate interface. Switch port mode trunk. That's it. Verify. Show interface, what interface, and switch port. That will tell you, what is it? Is it a trunk? Is it not a trunk? Is it uh, encapsulating? What version is it encapsulating? It's going to let you know. So verifying router configuration. Hop on the router. Show interface. Again, the appropriate commands here. Create the sub-interfaces. Once you've created the sub-interfaces, do the .1Q with the appropriate VLAN. Give it an IP address. Turn on the parent interface. That's it. You're good to go. How can we verify? Do a show interface. You could go through all of the interfaces and you can see the encapsulation. You can see where uh, their VLAN, where their trunks, where their access lines. Other common issues? Are the appropriate IP addresses set? Are the appropriate IP addresses for the sub-interfaces correct? Are the default gateways set? They're the common mistakes. Make sure you can uh, do show IP interface. Show IP interface brief. So you could be looking at the IP interfaces. You could be looking at if they're up, if they're down. You could also do a show run. So you could see the running configuration all the way through. All right, let's go ahead and move on to layer three switching. The next section is all about our routed ports versus our switched ports. Layer three switches usually have packet switching throughput in the form of millions of packets per second, PPS, packets per second. All catalyst multi-layer switches support the following types of layer three interfaces a routed port, i.e. a layer 3 port, versus a switched virtual interface, SVI. They also accept a switch port. That is going to be a port that you tell it is a switch port that will mimic a layer 2 port. Some of the higher level switches could be a, a Catalyst 6500 series switch. I actually have two in my possession right now. Or it could be a Catalyst 4500 series. These are all capable of acting like a layer 3 device. A Catalyst 6500, most people are not going to be able to get a hold on there. They're fairly expensive. They're nice, but expensive. Several other models of Catalyst switches do have specific routing protocols. You just have to figure out which ones you have and if they support them. Inner VLAN routing on those SVIs. Today, routing has become fast and cheap. And so those hardwares have to become fast and cheap. Routing can be transformed or transferred to the core and distribution layers without impact. Many users are in separate VLANs. They still need to have access to the appropriate resources that they need. Layer 3, routed ports are normally implemented between the distribution and core layer. This model is less dependent on spanning tree, and that means no loops, no black holes, meaning we're getting rid of a lot of layer 2 device ports. So by default, an, a, a switched virtual interface is created for the appropriate VLAN, uh, the default VLAN, which is VLAN 1. 
you can treat this like a virtual port or a port on the switch. You do that by interface VLAN 10 or VLAN 1 and that would create a virtual interface. Here if we wanted to create a virtual interface for VLAN 10, it is literally just interface VLAN 10. That would create a, sw a switch virtual interface named virtual or VLAN 10. It's virtual, it's not physical. You would have to associate it with a data frame. So you have to get, give it an appropriate VLAN. So encapsulate what VLAN? When the switch, uh, switch virtual interface is created, ensure that VLAN is present in the VLAN database. Make sure to set the virtual interface to the appropriate VLAN. That's critical. This is where most people mess up. Advantages. Router on a stick becomes a lot easier. Uh, no longer having to deal with multiple connections. No longer having to deal with a, uh, a layer 3 router or a router. Not limited to one link, meaning layer 2 ether channel can be used. Or a link aggregation protocol, LAX, could be used. A router's port is a physical port that acts similar to an interface, but is on a switch. A routed port. Think of that as just a layer 3 port. Layer 2 ports, such as Spanning Tree Protocol or STP, do not function on a layer 3 port. Again, that is how we tell a switch port what layer you're on. Switch port tells it layer 2. No switch port turns it back to layer 3 or a routed port. A specialized note, routed ports are not normally supported on lower switches like a 2960. Cisco does have a switch database manager, SDM, which provides multiple templates for 2960s. So you could do an SDM LAN based routing template, which would allow, uh, could be enabled to allow switches to route between VLANs. That way it's not really a switch port interface. It just, it's a workaround for the 2960s. You could uh, view them by doing a show SDM prefer. So you could see what templates are part of the switch database manager. Again, that's not normally preferred. You normally want to do switch virtual interfaces on layer 3 devices. Trying to get a layer 2 device to do it, possible, best solution. So, Configuration issues, last thing to cover. VLANs. VLANs must be defined across all switches. That way if you're doing VLAN 2, make sure VLAN 2 is on all the switches across the VLAN, or across all switches. Make sure the appropriate VLAN is defined on all switches. Next, VLANs must be enabled on the trunk ports. When you do your trunk ports, make sure you're allowing access for the VLANs. Ports must be in the correct VLAN. That's a huge troubleshooting issue. You program VLAN for interface 1. But in reality, you meant to do it for VLAN 1, but on port 11. Make sure you're doing the correct ports and assigning them to the correct VLANs. For the switched virtual interfaces, they have to have the correct IP and correct subnet. They must be turned on. They must match the VLAN number that they're in. For routing, routing must be enabled on our layer 3 switches. Each interface or network should be added to the routing protocol. Hosts, you have to make sure that each host is on the correct subnet, that they have the correct IP, subnet, default gateway. They have the appropriate VLAN information and they're plugged into the appropriate port on the switch that is the correct VLAN. So that's actually it for this chapter. There's a lot of good information, but this is actually a more trickier chapter. So if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thank you very much.
Okay, welcome. This is my Routing and Switching Essentials, Chapter 10. Today we're talking about specifically DHCP, or Dynamic Host Control Protocol. So we're going to be talking about basic DHCP. What is DHCP version 4? And what is DHCP version 6? And we're going to end with a nice little summary. So the objectives are to be able to talk about how to implement DHCP, the client, the server, basic configuration for all of the appropriate versions. So again, DHCP version 4 is specifically for IPv4. DHCP version 6 is for IPv version 6. This is also going to allow us to talk about Slack, and that is a version 6 type protocol. Alright, so without further ado, let's hop into our version 4 material. So DHCP uses three different types of address locate or allocation methods. We can manually allocate, automatic allocate, or dynamically allocate. So what's the differences? So manual allocation, the administrator assigns all pre-allocated IPv4 addresses to clients, and DHCP will communicate only the IPv4 addresses to the devices. So you can think of this as more like a reservation. I am pre going to set up your MAC address so that you're going to receive that specific IP address and that's it. But that means you have to manually allocate the specific MAC addresses so that they receive the appropriate ad uh, IP addresses. So there's also the automatic allocation where the DHCP will automatically assign a static IPv4 address permanently to a device. Selecting it from a pool of addresses, that means no reservations. It just, you get that permanently assigned address and that's it. Then there's the dynamic allocation. And that is dynamically assigns or leases address from a pool for a specific amount of time, normally seven days. So I'm going to give you an address and I'm only giving you it for seven days. After that seven days, I may take it back from you and I may reassign it or I may not. Just kind of depends. Normally an ISP for home users you get the dynamic allocation. It gives you an address for X amount of time. And it may give you back the same address but it may not. Just kind of depends. So our basic operations when a client comes up sends a DHCP discover broadcast and it would basically state I would like to request an address the server will then send a, a unicast response back to it known as a DHCP offer and it will go something like I am DHCP server here's an address that I can offer that way it's the beginning of this handshake the DHCP request will be responding as a broadcast and it will go I will accept this IP address. The DHCP server will respond with a unicast acknowledgement. Your acceptance is acknowledged. Essentially, okay, I'm giving you that address. And that's called the DHCP ACK, A C K, short for acknowledgement. And that's how the client will get its address. It's two parts from both sides. So the DHCP message format will be this type of format. We have our traditional head, header, our client IP address, your IP address, the server IP address, the gateway address, the client hardware address, the server name, the boot file name, the DHCP options. So this is going to be a specific type of header or a specific type of packet for our client. So that way it will have its Ethernet frame, the source and destination MAC address, the source and destination IP address, and then the appropriate datagram. And the datagram will have all of the appropriate information. So how do we configure it? A Cisco router running Cisco IOS 
can be configured to act as a DHCP server. Not saying this is a good or a bad thing, it's just we can have our hardware do it or we can have a server do it. And in this example, we are having our hardware do it. So, first thing we want to do is set up an exclude address. Then we'll set up a pool name. And then we're going to define the range of addresses that we can use. So, here we're going to list our exclude addresses. These are going to be addresses that we do not want to be able to hand out. Then we're going to go with our name. Here we're calling our DHCP pool. We're calling it LAN pool 1. From that LAN pool 1, we will give it the network, say the beginning portion of the network and the subnet mask. That's why you have to make sure to include the exclude addresses. That way, we can set reservation of addresses. So here we've been able to state what addresses will not be used. So we are excluding 1 through 9, and we're also excluding 254. That way, between this network and broadcast, or between the network and its broadcast, we will not be using specific addresses. For example, we already know 10.0, that's going to be our ID. Our range is going to use 1 through 254. I'm using a mouse to do this, so my writing is slightly off. 1 through 9 are preset aside. So that means we're going to be able to use 10 through 253 because we've excluded 1 through 9 and 254. If you want to disable DHCP, you can do the no service DHCP command, and that will disable it. All right, let's go on. Next slide. So how do you verify the server information? Oh, you know what? I forgot to talk about one important thing. Do not forget to set the default router. Do not forget to set the DNS. And make sure to set the domain name. Those are important. I talked about the network portion, but I forgot to bring up how to set the default router, how to set the DNS server. You can set two DNS servers, and you make sure to set the domain name. At the very end, do end, because you'll notice that when you're doing the configuration, you're going to be at the DHCP hyphen config prompt, and so all of these commands will be for the DHCP. You can do exit to exit out of that prompt. Okay, now we're done with this part. Let's go to verifying. How do we verify? We can do a show running config, pipe in the section DHCP, we could do show IP DHCP binding, show IP DHCP server statistics, or on the PC, once you get the appropriate address, do an IP config slash all at the command prompt, and you should be able to see all of the appropriate commands. All right, so now let's move on to our relay. So DHCP will use broadcast to communicate to the DHCP server. What happens if you don't have the ability to have the DHCP server in that network? You can set a helper address for the broadcast to a specific unicast address. And here it is. The command is IP helper. Sorry, the command is IP helper address and then the IP address. That way, it will forward that broadcast to a specific unicast address. So, if uh, you need to do it, that's important. Normally, helper addresses aren't really covered so much in the CCNA, but more for the CCMP material. Also, what happens if we need to set a DHCP address for our, our interface? Up until this point, we've always been manually doing it. But if you need to set a DHCP address on a outward facing interface, the command would just be IP address DHCP. That way, the interface itself will 
request their address. So in a normal setting, like a home network, the DATP address will come from the ISP and our interface, outward facing, will get the IP address from our ISP. Again, IP address DATP will allow us to do that. So troubleshooting. Task 1, resolve any conflicts, verify connectivity, test if all those cells test with a static address just to make sure, verify the appropriate switch ports, and verify from the same VLAN or subnet. So let's verify routing the ATP configuration. You can always do the appropriate show commands. So what about debugging DATV version 4? That's always an option. Alright, so let's go ahead and move on to our DATV version 6 material. So there is this thing called stateless address configuration, also known as SLAC, S-L-A-A-C. This is a method in which a device can obtain a global unicast address with the services of DHCP. So essentially, PC1 will send a router solicitation, RS, and it will basically go, I need a router advertisement from the router. And that will be an IPv6 multicast address, or multicast. The router will return a router advertisement here is your prefix, your prefix length, and other information. And that will be an IPv6 all node multicast. So what will happen after that, the PC will create a IPv6 version global unicast address. After generating its own ID, it can use the prefix and prefix length from the router to create its own address. Step four, it will duplicate address detection and it will verify there are no other addresses that are using it. So it will send out an IPv6 solicited node multicast. Basically, it's going to check to see if any other addresses are the same. So, the router advertisement will have a RA message. That message should show use the information in this RA message to obtain the additional information for an ADATP server version 6 if it has one. The router advertisement will also may send do not use information in the RS message, obtain all information from the DATP server. So here are two different types of statements. This one is going to use information from the RA and the DATP. This message will only use the DATP server. Because there's going to be different ones. If you don't have a DATP server, it will use the Slack only. So the Slack options, RS, the router solicitation. So RS will be sent that way. The RA will be sent that way. The RA will have different appropriate flags depending on the appropriate response. So the stateless DATP version 6 option. RS to the router. RA back to the PC, but the, this time the RA will say, here's the DHCP server, obtain it that way. And to the PC, we'll go to the DHCP server, and the DHCP server will act as a response. A stateful DHCP, the RA message will tell me that I need to contact specifically this guy. So the RS, the RA, the RA will say, don't use any of my information, contact the DHCP server. So this PC We'll go that way, and we'll get the appropriate information from the DHCP server. So, steps for DHCP version 6.
we've already covered this part over here. We're not going to have to recover the RS and RA. We're more focused on how we get the information from the DHCP server itself. So once PC1 gets told, use the DHCP server, it will solicit a response to all the DHCP servers. It will then, the DHCP server itself will return an advertisement as a unicast address. Then the PC will request or information request, which via unicast, back to that specific DHCP server, and then the DHCP server will send a reply, which will be a unicast. Pretty similar steps in IPv version 4, but different titles. Alright, so now that we understand how the function works, how do we program it? So to configure a router as a stateless DHCP version 6 server, first thing we have to do, make sure we turn on IPv6 unicast routing. Without that command, no IPv6 will work. So next, DHCP pool and give it a name. You set up the appropriate DNS, you set up the appropriate domain name. And then here, we go ahead and we program the appropriate address, the DHCP server, and the name, and any other uh, config flags that we need. That way it will respond on that interface. If we do not do this interface, it will not know what interface to respond to our request on. So this is not going to be globally configured. This is going to be configured per interface. That way we can have appropriate DHCP servers on specific interfaces. So to configure the router as a stateless DHCP client, navigate to the appropriate interface, IPv6 enable, then IPv6 address autoconfig. Autoconfig will let it use the Slack. So verifying stateless DHCP version 6 connectivity. We can always do a show IPv6 DHCP pool. That will show us the pool information. Also, we can do a show IPv6 interface, or we could do a debug IPv6 DHCP detail command. All right, so that covered a lot of our DHCP setup for version 6. But how do we configure a router as a stateful, not stateless, but stateful DHCP version 6 server? Again, make sure we set up unicast. We're going to set up our appropriate pool with pool name, except this time we're going to set up our addresses, our DNS, and domain name. And then at the appropriate interface, we will put the uh, address, the pool name, and any of the appropriate flags. That way, this guy right here will be pulling the information from our pool of addresses. How do we verify? Show IPv version 6 DHCP pool, show IPv6 DHCP binding, or show IPv6 interface. You're going to have to get used to the show commands just because me going over them won't do you justice. So make sure to do some basic troubleshooting with our show commands so that you get familiar with the appropriate output that they're going to be showing. So configuring a router as a stateful DHCP version 6 relay agent. And just like we did with IPv4 for our helper addresses, we are actually going to do an IPv6 DHCP relay destination instead of the IP helper hyphen address in the address. Instead, we use IPv6 DHCP relay destination then the IP address. So troubleshooting, we're 
pretty similar steps. Resolve the conflicts, verify allocation method, test static addresses, verify the switch ports, and verify subnet slash VLANs. So how do we ver uh, verify the router DHCP configuration? We could always do uh, specific show commands. Here is what our stateless DHCP server should look like. Stateless. That's what we're looking for. Remember, stateless, you don't give an address pool. This is what our debug should look like, and this is what the output we're looking for are the solicitations and or the interface pool information. Oh, I went back, sorry. And uh, that's actually it for our DHCP. Remember, manual automatic dynamic allocations for IPv4 and Slack and stateful addressing for IPv6. I wanted to thank you guys and hope you guys have a great day. You know what? I got one more summary slide. Remember our troubleshooting steps. And there's our last slide. Thank you guys very much.